everybody, it's Romania Black. Man, so <laughs> it is the uh, season finale of uh, Bungo Stray Dog season four. And I would be normally really sad about this. You know, I've been going on for several weeks about how we just don't know when season five is coming and it's going to be a long wait. And I may have other Bungo Stray Dogs projects to do to fill in the gap and the void of the emptiness of space after that. And what am I going to do with my life? But no, season five is coming out in like three months, baby. <laughs> Yes, it was shared on Twitter as well as the Discord to me today that season five of Bungo Stray Dogs, we're not going to have to wait that long. Not going to have to wait that long, which is good. Good and frustrating, and I'll tell you all why. Um, it's great because it's coming out in July of this year, which as I'm recording this, it's almost April. So that's just like a few months, which, you know, begs the question of one, why did they split it up in the first place? If you're only going to release it within a few months of each other, I'm not complaining. I'm fine with that. But one thing I am kind of complaining about is, like we talked in the last episode, um, everybody's been super nice on Patreon. And when I said that I suspect that there's probably things that have been cut out uh, from the manga in this adaptation, but I don't want to know because I am still going to record the manga reaction to what has been left out. I was very frustrated learning that season five is coming out in July because I was like, then why did you cut the stuff out of the manga in the anime adaptation. I'm like, why'd you do that, Bones? If you knew you were going to have the next part come out within a few months, you could have left it on a weird cliffhanger. You could have. You could have included all that manga stuff and then just let it hang out and then picked it back up in July. Why did you cut it out? So I'm not going to question it for now, but like I said in the last reaction, please don't tell me what's been cut out of the manga um, for episodes 12 and 13. I'm sure there's going to be stuff cut out maybe in this episode. I don't know. But um, when I'm back from my trip, probably at the end of April and into May, it'll most likely be May. But at some point in late April, early May, I will uh, sit down and go through the manga for season four, what we've gotten for episodes one through 13, and I'll do a reaction to the manga content that would start in episode 11 and do episode 11, 12, and 13. The manga content leading up to the end of episode 13, whatever we cover in this episode here. So, and part of me is like, but what if they take some of this manga content that was cut out and then put it into season five and rearrange it? What if they do that? Then am I spoiling myself? But at this point, I'm like, no, I don't think I am. I think they've just cut out some maybe like lesser stories or smaller things that weren't relevant to this main plot. And I do want to see that. So if it ends up being in season five, we couldn't help that. Bones, you should have got your act together. But having talked to a lot of people in the comments, I definitely understand the frustration. There's another anime series called Haikyuu that it recently had its fourth season. And there was a lot of things that pacing wise did not live up to my own expectations as a manga reader for that season. And now they've decided they're just going to take a hundred plus chapters and make it into two movies. And I'm, I, that's a whole can of worms in itself. But as a manga reader who loves that content, it is very frustrating when you see a studio that doesn't see what the fandom sees in terms of that content and doesn't find it as valuable and then leaves it out of an adaptation. And so when you get these expectations, you're like, oh, I can't wait to see that animated and then it's not, it is very frustrating. So I can totally understand, but like I said, just don't tell me what's been cut out. I'm going to do a reaction for it when I get back. It'll be later in April, early May, and that'll be a nice little thing to tide us over. We can do a nice little reaction to that manga, and then we'll have a few months, and then we can pick back up with season five. So that's really exciting. Um, I don't know the schedule for that yet. Don't know what day it's gonna be on. We'll figure that out when it comes. <laughs> it may, it probably will not be Saturdays because I had planned that the series replacing this one after starting next week is going to be followed up by season two of Jujutsu Kaisen. So I, it'll probably be, it might be Sunday. Um, it, it will probably be Sundays. We'll probably go back to Bungo Stray Dog Sundays, right? Stray Dog Sundays may come back to be a thing. I'm thinking that's what's going to happen is we're going to have Stray Dog Sundays uh, starting in July. That's what I'm anticipating. So, but we'll see, right? We shall see. So I have a couple comments before we start. And then I do want to talk about uh, Ongo's ability because that's been shared to me. So let's, let's, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, Velvety Yuri. 
pointed this out. And I remember somebody saying this back during season two and three, but I'd forgotten about it. But um, the voice actors for Octagawa and Lucy in this series are married in real life, which is hilarious because both Octagawa and Lucy like at sushi. So <laughs> I think that's really funny. I like that a lot. So thank you, Velvety Yuri, for sharing that. Um, Odd, Odd by talked about how <laughs> they said they're like, oh yeah, Ango and Mushitaro are a fun ship, except it's one of those and then they were both bottoms scenario because <laughs> I guess both of them are viewed as bottoms in relationships. But I will defend Ongo and say that I think Ongo could be a switch. I think Mushitaro is a bottom for sure. Um, not changing that anytime soon. But I think Ongo could be a switch. Maybe he could be a top if he was in a relationship with Mushitaro. Of the two, I think it could happen. So I think it still holds water. I think we could still do that, right? But that was a really funny comment. So thank you, Advai. Um, And then... People, a non-binary non Lung talked about Ango's ability, which is a discourse on decadence. And they were like, oh, it was mentioned in season two. But I'm going to be honest. I don't think the ability name was mentioned in season two. I think you spoiled me because I think that uh, it was hinted at what his ability was in season two. And it was implied. But I don't think they ever said his actual abilities name in season two. Y'all will have to show me the screenshot in the Discord or show me the screenshot on Twitter where we find that out because I don't remember it. I remember them making mention of his ability and some people said in the comments that it was actually used in season two. We just didn't see it. But, mm, and when I read the manga, I don't remember that name being mentioned either. So I think someone just said stuff out of order, but it's okay. I'm not going to read too much into Discourse on Decadence. We obviously know it allows him to look at objects and see their memories. We talked about it last episode. I did look up the power and what it was derived from. Um, according to the wiki site, it says the ability is a reference to Discourse on Decadence, a critique essay written in 1946 by the real life Ango Sakaguchi, who is one of the writers notably associated with the Baraya. Um, aside from dissecting the essence of Bushido in post-war Japanese society, he argued that a fall into decadence is inherent in humanity, which could help attain a rediscovery to and the salvation of human nature through, perse through perseverance in life rather than preservation throughout life. So yeah, it's basically this idea of just like living in the moment and pers persevering through life rather than just trying to like be in survival mode, like actually living your life, enjoying things. You know, decadence is often viewed as like that you can you view it in materialism, like luxury. I, I kind of like that, the idea of living your life. And I like how it's translated into him viewing objects and deriving memories from those objects. Because yeah, there is something kind of inherent with humanity that we get like heirlooms, like we have materialistic things that contain sentimental value and memories in them and we pass them on to other people. So that kind of goes along with that decadence, right? I think that's really cool. I like that a lot. And then um, just the brief overview of Ango. There's not a whole lot uh, on the wiki page for him, but he was born in Nagata. He was of a group of young Japanese writers to rise to prominence in the years immediately following Japan's defeat in World War II. And I can't remember if I talked about this with him during the Dark Age era, but essentially he was associated with the Baraya or Decadent School, a school of irresponsibility and decadence, which designated a group of dis dissolute writers who expressed their perceived aimlessness and identity crisis of post-World War II Japan, which is kind of cool because Ango's character in Bungo Stray Dogs, it's not that he has an identity crisis necessarily, but he struggles to know, like he's been involved, he's had his hands in all these different groups, right? He's been working with the seventh, you know, the seventh agency and the ADA and the government and the Port Mafia, like he's, and then working alongside or against the hunting dogs, like he's had his hands in all these different pots and it's not an identity crisis, but it's that he's been involved in literally everything and he's not cemented like what is his true allegiance to, right? Right, is it to Oda's memory like, like Dazai does? Like what is it? So um, in 1946, he wrote his most famous essay called um, Darakron or Discourse on Decadence, which examined the role of Bushido during the war. It is widely argued that he saw post-war Japan as decadent, yet more truthful than a wartime Japan built on illusions like Bushido. Bushido. Um, the work itself does not make any of these claims about the meaning of decadence. 
And so, yeah, he was the 12th child out of 13, which is crazy. Born in the middle of a Japan perpetually at war, which ties to Bungo Stray Dogs, right? His father was the president of the Nagito Shibum newspaper, a politician and a poet. So yeah, he decided to become a writer at a young age and he was very vocal in his opinions, which is kind of interesting because Ongo seems very quiet in the show until he like confronts you one-on-one -on -one, and then he speaks his mind quite candidly, which is interesting. Um, and then he received a lot of praise from writers such as Makino Shinichi. Interestingly enough, um, his, literally, his literary career expanded and even though um, he was met with some acclaim, he struggled for recognition as a writer for years before finally finding it with a personal view of Japanese culture in 1942 and again with On Decadence in 1946, which was, you know, in his 30s at that point. So in 1947, Ango Sakaguchi wrote an ironical murder mystery called The Non-Serial Murder Incident, translated and published in the French um, Muerte Sans Sari, which he received the Mystery Writers of Japan Award in 1948. He had a child at age 48 with his wife, Michio Kaji. He died from a brain aneurysm at age 48 in 1955 in Kiryu Gunma. So that's insane. He receives an award, has a child, and dies within the same year. What the heck? Like, that's crazy. Crazy that all that happened to him in one, like, brief period. Isn't that insane? Interesting. And then he has his one child is Suno, Suno Sakaguchi. Wow. So that's so interesting. I feel bad for him. Like he gets this, like all this happiness at once and then dies. Huh. Well, hopefully Ango the, in, in Bungo Stray Dogs does not um, have that same fate. So, but yeah, so like I said, I would normally feel really sad that we were at the end of the season, but I don't. <laughs> I'm sad that we have to wait a couple months, but It'll fly by so fast. As soon as there's only like a couple months in between seasons, it's over like that. So I, I'm not too worried then. So, but y'all, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. We've talked enough. So let's not waste any more time. We are going to start Bungo Stray Dogs season four episode, uh, episode 13. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's go. What a damn tease. <laughs> so no Octagawa. No Octagawa. You know what? I've just saved him for the next season. I wonder, I wonder if they did the OP first, like when they were first like plotting everything down and they're like, we'll just do the OP, you know, for this season first. Cause they've always done like 12 episode seasons for Bungo Stray Dogs. It's always been like 12 to 13 episode seasons. It's never been any more than that. And so I wonder if they plot out the OP and they're like, oh, and then as they were like starting to direct the episodes, they're like, we're not going to get to Octagawa at this point, are we? And so they're like, well, we better release season five soon so people don't get pissed we didn't see Octagawa. I can't believe we didn't see him all season. I can't believe we didn't see him all season. That just that blows my mind that we had things in the OP that we didn't touch upon in the actual episode. That's actually amazing. But Nikolai's back somehow. Should have known. Nikolai's back somehow um, and has an actual ability. So I just... How I I feel like I feel like Nikolai being alive is the will of is the will of the book. The page in the book like made it to where he wouldn't come back, where he wouldn't die, he'd come back. But and I'm glad Sigma isn't going to die. Glad that I we had just gotten to know Sigma a little teeny bit and the fact that he is a a literary he's like the page master come to life. Fjordor's the page master over here, bringing, you know, Sigma back to life. Uh, which we assume that the person that has the page in the book is the founder, whoever that is. We assume. We don't know. So, oh my god. Um, but, but, there are so many questions. <laughs> there are so many questions with this episode that I'm like, but, but wait. <laughs> so, okay. So, okay. We, since we have till July... Since we have till July, let, let's just strike down a few things. Um, we have questions, questions and unanswered 
unanswered um, plot points for for season five. We'll just put those right there. All right. We'll just put those right there. Oh, just failed. Failed to throw Huckleberry's toy. We'll just put that right there. Okay. So um, plot point one. We'll just we'll just work our way back. Um, Akatagawa. Octagawa, where has he been? Has he been hanging out with Natsume? Maybe? I, we haven't seen him at all, and I find it very weird because Mori, you would think Mori would be like telling Octagawa to go somewhere or to do something, but when he summons, you know, Tachihara and Gin and Tachihara, Gin and uh, Hirotsu, he doesn't mention him. They don't, nobody asks, Gein doesn't mention her brother, nobody mentions where he's at. So I'm like, is he with Natsume? Is he off, like, you know, at a, at a monastery somewhere? Is he, like, in the Alps? You know, where, where is Octagawa? So he is our big, like, where's he been? That, that's the big reveal that they're gonna reveal in season five. And then Natsume, we have no clue where he is. He's kind of a loose cannon, and Fyodor wanted him, if we go way back to the beginning of the season, Fyodor wanted to get him. So that's where we're at so that's rather interesting right um rompo we're just going to cover real quick before we get into the episode the, the threads that we didn't see in this episode at all so rompo uh rompo we don't know where he is at uh is he with poe is the guild involved what about francis where did he end up at what about francis and louisa we don't know about them um kudakita Kunikita, and then Kenji, and then um, Tanazaki. We don't know where they are. And the big question here is, since, since uh, Tachihara did not shoot Yasano, as we suspected, is uh. Yasano, is she in police custody? Because I find it hard to believe that they just didn't shoot her and then just left her there in the basement. They're like, okay, well... We're gonna go now. I can't. I just can't picture them just leaving her there, right? So they probably took her into custody, and they have her. I'm assuming that the hunting dogs. I'm assuming that she is with the hunting dogs. So we may have a rescue Yosano arc to deal with in here. Dazai's whole thing about God. We'll talk about that. That was absolutely freaking hilarious and wonderful and an amazing speech. But yeah, so there's there's our cast and characters. Um, as far as we know, uh, Lucy. And at sushi and Ango are still working together, which is such a fun dynamic. And then we'll say that Mushitaro is in there. I'm assuming, I'm hoping that Ango has Mushitaro like in his like safety witness protection program that we have that going on. Um, Hawthorne, we know the Hawthorne is trapped in Lucy's world. So, which is good. I had forgot all about Hawthorne being a threat, and then he shows up in the 11th hour, and then Lucy makes, like, makes use of him. So I'm glad that we've, I'm glad that plot point is resolved. We've gotten him out of the way. Done. And then Fyodor and Dazai are still in their little prison. We'll put them here. That Fyodor and Dazai. We have them to deal with, right? And then we have the fact that Nikolai is alive somehow and that he has rescued sigma we still don't know about the whole deal with the red coffin from the op and we don't know anything about the founder that is the one that has founded the the decay of angels so we don't know anything about them so that is being left in the dark right and we're assuming that the president of the the organization the government is you know in recovery so so there's lots of different threads right and the whole thing with Tachihara, I like Tachihara is kind of like, he's sort of like Ango in a way, sort of a triple agent, right? Because he was with, he was trying to get revenge for his brother and he joined the Port Mafia, but he was working with the hunting dogs. And now he's like realized the ADA. If anybody can reach anybody, it's at Sushi. At Sushi, if you, if you need a BFF, at Sushi's your man, right? I just, I love that. I think that's so good. It's great. And at Sushi's voice actor is Thorfinn from Vinland Saga. So, and Octagawa's voice actor is Knut from Vinland Saga. So it's just, it's just great, right? It's just absolutely wonderful. And then there are also Monado and Shu in Surinay. So it's like these, these two voice actors are just playing all the things. So basically you have, 
you have Minato, Thorfinn, and Atsushi, our Sunshine Boys of Spring 2023 anime, is played by the same voice actor. He must have had a great time doing all these shows. I know I would if I was playing those characters. So basically, we got all these plot points to resolve. But the, the main prime message here is that Atsushi... Atsushi is our literal Nakama beam. He is he has been through trauma his whole life and now he's helping others get through theirs. It's a wonderful thing, but man, I'm still kind of floored that Sigma is a creation from a book that he's not he wasn't born naturally he was literally made into existence. That is some insane power. That yeah, there's no gifted that created that because that's like that's taking Kunikita's ability and jacking it up, dialing it up to an, uh, an 1100, right? Because Kunikita can make like a grenade from a page in his book, but this is like making a person, like a full-fledged person with a consciousness and a soul, right? What? That's like, that's like going against nature, creating that, right? Sigma is like an abomination of nature, and yet I want to protect him. <laughs> I want to give him a hug and protect him because bless him, he knows nothing else. Except the, the short time of his existence, the three years of his existence. Oh my god. So yeah, I, again, I want to um, just theorize places where I feel like the plot was kind of maybe glossed over. And that is the idea of the whole, the whole them getting out of the casino boat and getting, I had kind of hoped we would have had, I honestly, here's my thoughts of what I thought was going to happen. I thought that the entire episode was going to be them trying to get away from the people on the casino ship. And then I figured that the leader, the man that looks like the cat, uh, Jinichi, Jinichi, he would show up. And that's when Octagawa would show up. And then we'd have a big battle on the Sky Casino. And that would be the end of the season. And they'd leave us on like a cliffhanger of, oh, maybe the Sky Casino is going to fall from the sky or something and be in a danger. And, and that's where we're going to leave things. We didn't do any of that. <laughs> we were on this the Sky Casino part for like a hot five minutes. I was like, oh. So I feel like in the manga, there's probably more with that. I don't want any confirmation or deconfirmation. I'm going to read the manga when I get back from my trip and find out for myself, right? So I'm going to end the manga essentially where, where this ends of Nikolai finding Sigma. I'm going to end at that point and then we'll have season five to look forward to. So that'll be exciting. I feel like, here's my thing. I feel like that moment of Sigma getting saved by, Sigma getting saved by, um, oh, Nikolai, I feel like that is the end of a volume. It feels like I've read enough manga to know that it feels like the end of a volume. Like, oh, he saved him. What? He's still alive. What? Like, and that's the end of volume, whatever. And then you have to read in the next volume, find out what happens. I feel like that's going to be the case. I could be wrong. So I'm hoping that that's the case and that it just ends the volume. And then I'll have a nice clean place to end before season five starts. But we'll see. We'll see. So yeah, I, I'm going to pick up the manga around where episode 11 starts. So around the stuff with Mushitaro and the bank break in to rescue Mushitaro. That's where I'm going to like react to the manga from there on, right? To see what I've missed. That's what we're going to do. We're going to cover the contents of episodes 11, 12, and 13. I'm going to react to the manga for those. So, and if it's a lot of manga, it will be a big old long reaction. So just to forewarn you, I'm fully anticipating it. Although I feel like Bungo Stray Dogs for me, the manga is a pretty quick read. I just, it, I go slower because the artwork's so good, right? But man, so Taruko, can we talk about her? We talk about Taruko. Taruko and her terrifying ability, right? Although it's not as terrifying as I thought for a second, right? Her ability is to control age. But here's the thing. She can reverse it. I thought it was going to be like a permanent thing. Like once she ages you or de-ages you, you are stuck like that forever if she wants you to. And maybe that is the case. But she does make that guy go back to normal. So we'll see. But that is a terrifying ability. I don't want to know the name of it. They didn't tell us the name of it in the episode. I want to wait till we get the actual name name dropped before we find out. And that'll probably happen in season five, right? We'll get the name drop for her ability. Um, Techo's, we know already, it's the, the plum blossoms and snow. We'll get um, Jono's 
and then we know the leader his is like um like lion like tiger moon or something tiger mirror or something like that we know that although we don't we haven't seen it in action or maybe we have we don't know that we have so yeah that's Taruko is fascinating and, and it all makes sense now she is she's literally bisky she's bisky she has that ability to, to, to change her age but then it gets added on she can change other people's ages right it's great so yeah poor 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 I just feel bad poor poor Tachihara being like I'm stuck with her what the heck so okay We'll go out of this OP and get back here. So yeah, their whole objective is just to get the key so they can get the Sky Casino. I, I will give Fjordor credit. I really did not see it coming that this was all an elaborate trap for the ADA. It was luring the ADA into this false sense of security, right? So let's outline what the plan was going to be. The ADA's plan, their plan was to use the casino... To, that they had gathered info on and found out it was connected to Fjordor and the Decay of Angels. We'll just say the Decay of Angels was here. And it was to lure the hunting dogs. And then it was going to um, reveal, reveal the Decay of Angels to the hunting dogs and forge an alliance between the hunting dogs and the ADA, or at least that was my understanding of how this was supposed to go down. And I really thought it was going to work. I thought that Atsushi and Kyoko were going to help. I thought they were going to help the two, uh, Tachihara and Taruko, and I thought they were going to help them and then reveal Sigma was working for the Decay of Angels and reveal all this info. I had these lofty ambitions. <laughs> and that is not what happened. And speaking of Kyoka, we can't forget her. She, as far as we know, is still in the casino. We think she's still in the casino. We don't know what happened with her. Did she fight Taruko and Tachihara? Did they just leave her? Did she go hide? We have no idea. They, they left. I feel like Taruko and Tachihara left the casino. So did they just forget about Kyoka and leave her there? We don't know yet, do we? But that was the plan. But this was, you know, at sushi. At sushi. Um, Kyoka. And Ango. That was their whole plan with this. But Fjordor's is a little bit different, right? And they were going to reveal to the, the, not only the DA, but also the terrorist attack, right? That was going to be the idea. That was going to be the idea to get them over to their side, was to reveal the terrorist attack that Fjordor and the Decay of Angels had planned. So Fjordor, though, he instead was going to use the casino to be a trap for the ADA to lure in the hunting dogs and then he was going to find a way to make the ADA and the Decay of Angels look like allies and then tie the ADA to the terrorist attack with the coins. And then thus the ADA would still be a threat. And it would just like defeat the whole purpose. It was basically going to take the trap that they thought they were going to spring and just completely flip it on its head and make it to where the ADA were still seen as the bad guys even after this. Only now, it's not just something that's in Japan. The ADA was going to be seen to be a threat on a global level because everyone go filters through the Sky Casino and it's tied to all these other nations and it's a national threat instead of just... It's an international threat rather than just one in Japan. So that's, that's really bad. But the thing about it is that kind of mucks up Fyodor's plan is that at Sushi left behind, left behind info that Tachihara got a hold of. And he destroyed it, which sucks because on the one hand, they, he destroyed it and it didn't work. But on the other hand, he seems like he was convinced by it. Like Atsushi spoke through him and reached him. What's interesting is Atsushi, he not only has Nakama beamed uh, Tachihara in all this, but I think Octagawa, I mean, let's be real. He's, he's Nakama beamed Octagawa. Um, definitely Dazai. Dazai is like, you know, on there. But I also think Mori. I also think Mori in some ways. And that seems weird. But Atsushi and Mori, they've known each other since season one. And I don't know. I feel like there's a reason Mori is not affected by 
the page in the book. And I don't know if it's just like the utmost faith he has in Fukuzawa, if it's him knowing at sushi, like what it is, but he's not affected. Neither is Lucy. It's that love that Lucy has for at sushi that allows her to not be fooled by the page in the book. And I wonder if that's part of it. If the, if the page in the book can't control like the power of devotion and love, right? Because that's kind of what breaks through Tachihara at the end was the fact that Tachihara his found family, yeah, you could argue the hunting dogs were his found family, but is it really the Port Mafia that's his found family? Because that was kind of Tachihara's thing. Tachihara, I'll put him on here. Tachihara did not want to be a hero like his brother, but also not the opposite. He wanted to be his own person. So he didn't want to just be like the hunting dogs. He didn't want to be like, you know, just a regular civilian or whatever, or a gifted agent of the government. He wanted to kind of do his own thing. And the Port Mafia sort of allowed him to do that. So that's kind of fascinating, right? Kind of fascinating that, that he kind of realized his own found family in this. I also like that Taruko made herself into an old lady by, I was noticing like the red hair. I'm like, I wonder if it's her in disguise. It literally is. She made herself old to escape. That's, and she, cause she can control her age. That's awesome. And then yeah, her just walking past and has a little buggy and then tiny little Tachi, baby Tachihara as a little kid is stuck inside. That's so good. I love it. And she just basically gets them, she knocks them out and is able to control her age. I came to be the shit out of you wretched criminals. Mm -hmm. And the little baby Tachihara, I love it. And she makes fun of him, saying he needs to come to the parties as a kid. And Tachihara says this is the most feared ability in the hunting dogs. Yeah, controlling age is terrifying because you can make someone into a baby that is defenseless. Or you can make them into an old, decrepit person that can't do anything. Like, that is pretty scary. It's not like, it's not an ability that physically harms someone directly, but can really impact them, right? Wild, y'all. It's wild. And so, yeah, she manages to get the information that Sigma has the only key. I like that she chooses this form as like a preteen. I like that that's the form she chooses the most, is just having this preteen. Like, it's at her peak, peak kingdom, right? And so, yeah, then we come back to variety show hour between uh, Dazai. Yeah, yeah, Taruko says she's going to take Sigma's head. And so Dazai's like, why is he so powerful? Because he has no memories. And Dazai tries to, like, make a joke out of him. He's like, man, if the, the waitress at my shop would be the most powerful, too, because she doesn't remember any of my orders. Ha, 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 ha. Fjordor does not find the funny humor in Dazai in this, though. He says no matter how committed Sigma is, He's like, the hunting dogs are in a different league. And that's what Fjorda says. No, 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 no. It's not that they're in a separate league. Sigma is in a higher league than all of us. And I'm like, but Sigma's an ordinary, ordinary man. Sorrowful music runs through his veins. I like that Fjordor uses like musical references in all of his stuff. Like he uses that as a reference. It's fun. Yeah. His alienation is absolute. The Sky Casino is the only thing that shares that with him. Like, it's just like the Sky Casino is this, like, prison. It's this big castle he's supposed to stay in. Like, his, the only purpose of his existence, which is absolutely terrifying, right? He can't afford to lose it. And then I like the Dawes. I kind of figures it out. Like, wait a minute. What? He was born three years ago when he was written into the book. So we have this, like, church in the middle of the desert. I'm wondering if we're getting stuff that's missing from the manga about that. I feel like part of Sigma's backstory is maybe missing, so I'm excited to read the manga, but there's like this church in the desert that's half buried. What? He says, can such a thing really be called human? That's the thing about it, is that he meets Fjordor in the church. I'm like, Sigma has a personality. He has a conscience. He has like, he seems to have his own brain and intelligence. Like. That is some messed up stuff that you've, you basically created a real life AI and then said, here you go. Like, it's like Sigma's literally AI. He's just literally artificial intelligence that 
has gained a soul in all of this. Because I think he has. That's so messed up. He says, would you not like a home? And he gave himself a name. Sigma. And so then he says he finally has just one place to go home. The Sky Casino. And it's a ticket. It says Skyfall. Okay. I feel like there's stuff left out from the manga that we'll have to touch on when we get to this. But what a reveal. Yeah, because it says Skyfall. And it says it's like an airlines. It's like, yeah, a, a plane ticket. Uh-huh. Interesting. And he says, good day, Mr. Manager. All right. And so then Sigma. Oh, man. I was wondering what Sigma was going to do to try and battle her. And he's pretty straightforward. He's like, I'm just going to blast the crud out of her. And that that's going to be the way that he does it. But poor Atsushi. I like that Atsushi's using his tiger ears more. He's like, he's like, I can hear things. I know what to do. It's really cute. And then Kyoka telling him, being like, just go. And at Sushi, he doesn't want to leave Kyoka behind. I'm assuming she's okay. We don't know otherwise. It would be cool if Kyoka ended up using the Sky Casino to, like, do something in the next season. But I don't know. But poor at Sushi. At Sushi being the most empathetic being in this series, right? He just wants to be friends with everybody. Power of the Nakama, indeed. But yeah, so... I like that she throws the kitchen knives into the gun, the Gatling guns, and tries to get him. And then he has the resonance gun. And she, I like the idea that she breaks her eardrums so that the gun won't work. Because I was afraid. I was like, oh, she's going to die. And this series not been afraid to kill off people, supposedly. That I'm like, I don't know what else we're going to do with this. But yeah, he uses the gun and she manages to get through it. Being like... And so then the whole story she tells about the hunting dogs, right? The hunting dogs and their physical prowess, how they did that. So, so there's something I feel like, again, the manga is going to expand upon. But we have the idea that the hunting dogs, them being augmented, that they had, that they surgically had their powers added. Now, how that works, I, anime logic, right? We're going to let that go. We're going to just not question that too much. It was result of surgery carried out by doctors with special abilities. Okay, so the doctors had special abilities. So it's like the doctors were gifted and they used their powers to make their gifted powers even more gifted. So it's just like a big domino effect, right? But she says the inhuman nature of the surgeries made it such that if we miss a monthly follow-up, then our if we miss one of the monthly follow-up surgeries, our flesh rot and we die. What? So they have to go every month. They have to go every month for a checkup or they will fall apart. Now I'm assuming that includes Tachihara. So he's been basically leaving the mafia, Port Mafia every month to go for these checkups. I feel like Mori knows that Tachihara is with the hunting dogs. Because uh, Hirotsu and Gin make it out to think like they don't know that he's with the hunting dogs. They make it out to think that, that he was not one of the ones that attacked them. That he's totally innocent. I think Mori knows. I think Mori knows. But he realizes that Tachihara is much more valuable close than he is far away. So he's not saying anything. I feel like Mori knows that Tachihara is working with the hunting dogs. I mean, if he left every month, you know, routinely, you'd think that Mori would go try to check up on that because he's just that paranoid of a person. So maybe Mori knows, maybe he doesn't. But I feel like even if Mori did know, he would want Tachihara to stay in the Port Mafia because it's it's like, you know, you keep your friends close, your enemies closer. He's like, he's more effective if we know exactly what he's doing than if we let him go. So that's a thing. And Sigma's like, why would you go so far? We're the manifestation of this country's order. Without it, those who thrive through violence would conquer the people. So she's like, we are, we're the justice. So basically she's like, we are the order, the justice to help control the chaos. 
She's like, people would conquer everyone else if we didn't exist. It's like, that's the price that we pay, right? And she says, without it, she says, I'm not going to tolerate a vile world. She's like, the hunting dogs employ maximum violence. Mm -hmm. As slaves of society, will not spare even our own selves from order's flame. So yeah, she's basically like, we're going to do the dirty work so that everybody can live in peace. She's like, I'm not about to see my world thrust into darkness. So if we have to become the darkness to make sure that the rest of the world stays in the light, then we'll do it. And I get that, that, that the hunting dogs make a lot of sense. It, it all adds up. And Sigma's like, I've been alive for three years. So <laughs> she's like, I don't understand. Right. And then she like dangles him out. Right. And he's like, nope, I'm going to die. And you're going to die with me. I'm going to save at least one of these things. And it's going to be the casino. Mm hmm. And so then she decides that she can't catch him alive and she lets him go to kill him. And that's when Atsushi saves him. And I was like, okay, well, Atsushi can become his friend. Atsushi can become anybody's friend. So we're good there, right? Right? So, but, and I wanted Sigma and Atsushi to have more time together. I feel like the series is setting up Atsushi and Sigma to become friends or at least to become characters that will see each other more than once. Because, yeah, I feel like that is the case. Because Atsushi kind of knows about, you know, identity and loss and not knowing oneself or one's purpose and like wandering aimlessly. Like Atsushi knows exactly what that's like. That's been his life for so long. So when he hears Sigma saying that, he's like, oh, well, hell no. I can't let another fellow vagabond walk this earth alone. No, 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 no. So I feel like he def definitely wants Sigma to be helped. So, and that's when he shows him the thing of, of Ongo saying that he's, you know, they're going to use his ability to find out where the page is. But Sigma says that they've already taken precautions to protect against that ability. But we don't know what those precautions are. The, the mangaka chooses not to tell us, or the series does. And I like that Ongo figured out that it was not Rompo that stabbed the president. It was... It was Sigma using Mushitaro's ability, right? They 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 erased the the evidence erasing was reversed, right? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. So, and I like that Sigma says that it wasn't his intention. He didn't mean to stab him. Things just escalated and got out of hand. And then, but what gets me is he says he decides he can't do this anymore. He's like, he's like, I don't know my reason for being, so I'm just going to give up. And I was like, what? So I feel like that moment where he says he's just giving up and Atsushi goes, oh, I can't let you do that. I feel like that part was a little rushed. And I feel like there's probably more in the manga for that part. We'll see. But that very well could be the case. Because then he just jumps off the building and it's like, but wait, no, don't do that. Why are you doing this, Sigma? I like his little, also Sigma has like little, um... They look like little shark teeth or tiger teeth earrings. Seems kind of on the point, on point. But yeah, at Sushi feeling bad for Sigma and then Hawthorne shows up. WTF. Like, why? I hate it. And Hawthorne attach, attacks Sigma, which I'm like, why? And gives him like the scarlet letter A. And attack Sigma, and then Sigma falls. Like Sigma, like Fjordor was just going to take him out. If they take out Sigma, they can't get the page, right? That's how it's going to go. And Sigma says he feels like it would end this way. I like that Atsushi just uses his tail to hang on. Wouldn't have ever thought of that, so I'm glad that he decides to do it. And then, yeah, Atsushi, you never knew your reason for being... Those are the words that can never be a person's last. It's wrong. I feel like Atsushi, our sweet cinnamon bean, our tiger bean. Mm-hmm. I want him and Sigma to become friends. That's all I want. Season five, give me these things. And then Sigma looks so pretty as he falls. Like, no. I was hoping that Lucy would save him. I was hoping Lucy would save Atsushi and then they'd go down even further and find and find Sigma and save him. But and Ongo. Ongo feels like they're just gonna, like, like everything's over. Ongo takes, like, the despair fairly well. 
when he's like, well, we've lost. I was like, you're taking this rather well, sir. Because the idea that Sigma is dead and everything's gone up in smoke, you're handling this with a lot more calm than I would imagine. But I wonder if he's also talking with Dazai right now, like communicating through their heartbeats to figure out what's going to happen. I wonder if that's the case. I, mm, I don't know. I don't know. But I just love the idea of, of Lucy saving them. And I love that she takes Hawthorne out. I'm like, that's great. Get that done. And then I like that they stuck Ongo on the little chair, like in the seat. That was great. But yeah, now Taruko and them have seen that the hunting dogs, they've seen that the ADA was helping Sigma. And that was Fjordor's plan. The whole thing was a big old trap. Sky Casino, the coin bombs, the terrorist attack. Like they made it so obvious to lure them there to try to frame them even more. And now it's like on a global scale. Mm -mm. But here's the thing. And they say everything is happening according to Fyodor's plan, right? He says, we've lost. And then that's when we see, you're unbelievable. I haven't done anything. I sat here and prayed. That's the thing. Fyodor has this weird, like, this, these, like, god diatribes that he's, like, going on about. He did this in season three, and now he's doing it in this one, saying that he prayed to God. Prayers always reach God. And he's like, even the coin bombs were a decoy. Just a means to draw the hunting dogs and the detective agency to the casino. And he's like, why? And then Fyodor, Fyodor's like, Fyodor looks like the cat that ate the canary. He's like, he's like, oh, Why? He's like, shouldn't it be obvious, Dazai? He says, it's more beautiful that way, is it not? And so Tachihara, meanwhile, is trying to gain information, right? He's acting on his own. And then, I'm sorry, but the the vanilla envelope with the with the flash drive with the arrow that says, put this in, Tachihara does not need to be near any type of emails that are that are in threat of spam malware. Because I feel like somebody would send him an, an email that would be like, click the link here, your password's out of date, and he'd be like, okay. And just do it, right? I feel, I'd be like, I would be checking that shit if I was gonna look at this suspicious envelope. So the question is, was the envelope and the flash drive was that planted by Fyodor and his men, or was it planted by Atsushi or and Kyoka? Like, what was the deal? Because he's because Tachar is trying to gain evidence. And he says, "What is this?" So he puts in the flash drive, and then the thing with Atsushi pops up, and it looks like it was videotaped in Ongo's. So maybe Ongo left. Maybe Ongo had uh, Atsushi and them drop it off. And he says, "I will share the truth of the case with you." in hopes that you are a sensible person. So, okay, maybe Ongo left the materials there for Tachihara to find. And that's when Tachihara, he's like, oh, the masterminds behind the terrorist attacks are the five gifteds, the decay of the angels. They've stolen a device known as the page that amends reality. And they've smeared the detective agency with their crime. And, and we don't get to hear any more. And so Fyodor says, I suppose you've been spreading a web of conspiracies yourself, right? He's like, but God prefers perfection and harmony. Yeah, so, okay. So Fyodor talks here about God wanting perfection Wanting perfection and harmony. And that's kind of, again, one of his incentives around destroying, around destroying the gifted. To create the supposed balance, right? So on one hand, we have Ongo giving this information to Tachihara that connects to Atsushi pleading the case, right? But Fyodor, I'm going to put him here. Fyodor says he knows about what they're doing. He's like, I know that you're trying to plant information to try to do this with Tachihara. He's like, I see through your propaganda. In accordance to God's will, I added a particular line to the page. Like, Fyodor seems so proud of himself here. He's just like, he's like preening. He's like, I added a line because I anticipated that you would be trying to clear your name. So I added a line to the page. And it says, Tachihara, have you found anything? 
And as the final stage of their plan, they intend to write the demise of the state onto the page. Yeah, so as Sushi's telling him everything, like what all is going on, right? And Tachara's like, that is the full story of the worldwide terrorism attack. And, and that's when Tezuka's like, what's the matter? Just false information meant to throw off the investigation. And he destroys it. But the thing of it is, is that, yeah, sure, Tachihara, he destroyed the flash drive. But he still heard, like, 90% of it, right? So he kept it, he kept the hunting dogs and others from seeing it. So even though that sucked in the moment that he destroyed it, because I was like, oh, no, that was the only thing clearing their name. Tachihara may be the one that needed to hear it, and that's it said, a modification to ensure they don't believe the detective agency's innocence. He says, yes, all law enforcement and investigative bodies that happen upon evidence of the detective agency's entrapment will dismiss it without consideration. So, Fyodor says in that moment, he's like, it doesn't matter. I added a page. He said, I added a page to the book. And the page in the book says that everything will be dismissed if found. Which is controlling people's will, right? That's acting as, you know, God yourself, right? Which, granted, they have been this whole time with the page in the book, like creating Sigma and killing people and maybe bringing people back to life, all that sort of thing. So, but this is like, controlling their actual will, right? That they would dismiss it and that would be it. It's not like destroying information. It's not making it unseeable. It's just like literally controlling people's minds. And Dazai just staring at him. That's what I wrote in the page. Like, like Fjord was very much taking the role of God with the page and he said he wrote it in, okay? So he created all this. In other words, the plot to get the hunting dogs on your side was futile to begin with. It wasn't going to work based on what I told him. And then Tachara's like, you want me to infiltrate the Port Mafia again? And they're like, we've gotten in touch with the surface. The detective agency has taught, crossed a line with the coin bombs. This is no longer a state's criminal matter. The whole world is going to be on them. Which means we ought to be the ones to catch them. And Tachara's just like, I have to infiltrate the Port Mafia again? Like, I'm going after them and find out where the last two members of the agency have run off to. And he thinks of Kenji and, and Tanizaki. And she asks if he's reluctant. And he's like, I'm just annoyed with having to keep dealing with them. And she just laughs about it. She's like, ah, ha, ha, ha. She's like, but that's, she's like, you, you're particularly born to do undercover investigations with your special ability. And so you did it when you eliminated the mafia members who were aiding the detective agency. Uh-huh. So she thinks, so the, the hunting dogs, the hunting dogs think that Gein and Hirotsu are dead. But they know Yasano's alive. So how does that work? Hmm. And he's like, yeah. But then I love that he goes, we cut to him going back. To, the, to seeing Hirotsu and Gein, right? Like, I heard you were stabbed in the gut. And he's like, it wasn't as bad as I thought. And she said, same as us. So, so he supposedly killed them, but the wounds were shallow. It was like when you're cutting the head, there's a lot of blood and it looks awful, but it's not as bad as you think. Yeah, so it looked a lot worse than it was, right? The wounds were rather shallow. It was all just an act. It was as though the attack was an act. Yeah. Tachihara, he's like a triple agent at this point, right? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Absolute madness. Absolute madness, y'all. I tell you. Absolute madness. And he said, what's the point if we're both alive because we were going easy on each other? Uh-huh. Yeah, and he baps, he baps him. Yeah, and we don't see his eyes. Uh-huh. He says, hey, old man, do you think I'm cut out for the Port Mafia? And they both laugh at that. They're both like, yes, you, you've been you've been with the Black Lizard for how many years? Yes, you are cut out for this. And I love that they just kind of laugh at that. They're like, and Tachihara doesn't know what to do. And then Dazai laughing. God, I love this scene. It's my favorite in the whole episode. 
where he's just like, Miyana Mamoru can pull off an evil laugh just so good, right? And he says, you don't know anything about God, do you? He's like, you've never really seen how this works, right? And I, the thing about it is, Fjordor says, I'm listening. Like, Fjordor doesn't know. He doesn't. He, it's like he's seeking it because he doesn't know the answer for himself. He's just guessing what, what he thinks is right. And Dazai's like, you don't know how this is, do you? He's like, don't you know? And I love this perfection and harmony. God cares more about your pores than he does that. I, that line, mm, he's like, don't you understand? And then we see Oda dying. He's like, he's famous for his coincidences and absurdism. Yeah, it's just like that. He's like, don't you know the the uh, the dark irony and everything, like karma, like all that. He's like, no, 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 harmony and perfection. No, that's not how this goes. Dazai is like, it is all about coincidence, absurdism, karma. Like, there's no, there's the the cosmic irony. He's like perfection and harmony. It's not nearly that boring. No. And I love that we have, he says, I've seen it countless times. Like he, he's saying like, he's like, Oda died. You think that was perfection and harmony? No, that was far from it. I, it's like Dazai being so self-deprecating this moment, thinking someone like me lived, but someone that was perfect like Oda died. And you think that that's just, he's like, and then you think that that's how the world works? Oh no, honey. I just, it was very much a, oh honey moment. No matter how masterfully you devise your schemes, where we are is here in this prison. I love it. A prison at the ends of the earth. The ones that run the world are in fact the ones who howl. And we see Nikolai, we see Ango, we see Lucy, we see the hunting dogs run and shed blood in incidental storms. Yep. Yep. You and I are powerless in the face of their intense spirits. And we see Sigma and Atsushi there. So he's like, you and I, he's like, Fyodor, you think that you're the, the omnipotent one here. And that he's like, but you and I, we are not. We're the ones in the prison. Yeah, I love that. I love that he says that Fyodor and Dazai, they are the ones imprisoned because they know too much. They know too much and they have all these like ideas of how things should be, but that's not the way the world works. He says that the ones who howl with their spirit, like the, the common man, like Sigma, like Atsushi, they're the ones that run the world. They're the ones that control it. We're just the ones that unfortunately we know too much, but we can only do so much. I love it. And Fjord is just like not happy with that. He says, do you know what that means? And then we cut back to Tachihara and they say, you are mafia among mafia, black among black. Your rashness, your hotheadedness, your reckless valor. That's, that's the Port Mafia to a T. You're a model for the rest of the Port Mafia. It's like Octagawa. It's like, it's just, he's like, you're a model Port Mafia member. What are you, why are you questioning it? Like you are, you're embodying everything we stand for. And then Tachihara says, why am I feeling this way? I infiltrated the Port Mafia to take revenge for my brother. But no, that's an excuse. I love that that moment Tachihara acknowledges. He's like, actually, I did not do this for my brother. I just say that I did to like as an excuse. But that's not the real reason I joined the Port Mafia. I wanted to become someone who was neither my brilliant brother or his opposite. I wanted to be, he's like, I wanted to be myself and make my own decisions. Ah, oh, I love it. And then he spared Yasano. But then again, like, why, where did she go? Did they just take her into custody? I'm assuming. And that's when she says, I'm sorry about your brother. Mm-hmm. And she apologized, yeah. Mm hmm. The freaking detective agency. Vicious terrorists. What is wrong with these people? Yeah, it's like everything that everything he's been told based on the evidence created by the book is being contradicted by how 
by how the agency members are acting. Like Yasano's actions, her words, they're not lining up with the narrative, right? It's it's just it's bumping against each other and it's conflicting. So he's like, what is the deal? And then Maury gets on that and says, well, the agencies, like, they only have an innocence or they, they're only going to go after an innocent verdict or death. He's like, they are convinced they're not guilty and they're going to keep fighting. And the world, even though it's convinced of their guilt, it's just going to be this big thing. He's like, I'm not convinced. And then Tachihara, who is loyal to the Port Mafia and has his found family here, is like, now wait a minute. The actions of Yasano is contradicting everything we've been told about her based on the page. And he's like, Mori thinks that they're innocent. And he's worked enough with Mori to know that if he believes they're innocent from the beginning, there must be something to it. Because he wouldn't just trust the agency out of a gut feeling or out of sympathy. Mori doesn't act like that. He always has a reason. And so then he thinks back to the video that's shown by Atsushi and it all starts to fall into place that something's been wrong this whole time. Do you, what do you think of the detective agency? Do you think they're actually terrorists? And then I like that Gein's like, did you hurt your head or something? Or no, it's Hiroshi that says that. He's like, the truth about the port mafia is obvious to anyone. Right? And she's like, oh yeah. She's like, it's not even worth considering. They're definitely innocent. If you're port, if you're port mafia, it ought to be obvious to you too. And that's when we have the page in the book. And he says, "Of course, the answer was crystal clear." And we go back to that part where he was considering what he learned. And so the page in the book says, "Fyodor." So Fyodor has been the one writing in the book. All law enforcement and investigative bodies that happen upon the evidence of the detective agencies entrapment will dismiss it without consideration. And then it just breaks apart. It breaks reality. And he realizes the truth. And has decided that the government's got the wrong people. We have to persuade the government. He breaks through it. Yes. And Dazai, he says, humans are sinful and foolish. But they aren't quite as boring as you think. Again, yeah, Dazai going back to that party is like, who cares if they're sinful? That's what makes them fun. Ah, Dazai, I love it. He looks so innocent in that shot, too. Mm hmm. And that's when we cut to Sigma being like, well, it's been a fun life. I guess I'll just die now. And then somehow, somehow Nikolai saves him. Now, how? How? I don't know. He's just sitting there laughing. Time for resurrection magic. Like how, what, when, where's the red coffin? What's happening? And that's where we end the episode. How? Although I'm a little bit worried. Nikolai is quite crazy. So the fact that Sigma is with him is going to be ridiculous. I'm like, what is, what, what is Sigma going to do? What is this nonsense? What? I'm like, how is this going to go? So... I don't know. I don't know. But, oh my gosh, y'all. This episode was a lot of fun. And I really, really enjoyed it. Skyfall, indeed. I I really enjoyed this episode. I, I feel like I have the benefit of being anime only at this point. I do feel like that's nice. Because I had somebody ask me in the Discord. I think it might have been Dana. Asking if I would read the manga after this season. Or if I would wait for season five. Well... I'm waiting for season five now, <laughs> obviously, but I, I kind of don't want to read the manga first with this series because of these last two episodes, because I really, I enjoyed episode 12, even though I knew it was rushed, I still enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed this episode, even though I'm sure there was stuff left out as well. And I feel like if I had read the manga first, I would have a much more negative an angry reaction if it wasn't how I wanted it because I am very much the type of person that I want it adapted exactly from the manga to the anime adaptation. I want it beat for beat only animated because if you like a manga and you like those moments the whole point in watching the anime is seeing them in a new medium adapted in the way that will make it be what you want and so when they cut stuff out it's very frustrating and I feel like if I read the manga 
then watching the anime, I will already have this preconceived notion. There won't be any surprises. It won't be anything like that. So I think that post, you know, beyond season five or whatever, I will just wait for the anime to come out. But I am going to in a couple weeks. <laughs> in a couple weeks, I am going to um, react to the manga leading up from the contents of volumes 11, 12, and 13. So it'll be a couple weeks. I've got a trip that I have to go on um, that's going to be like a 10-day trip. It's going to be crazy. So like I said, um, probably the end of May, end of April, early May, I'll get to it. And then I'll probably post it like on a Sunday or something since by that point, Buddy Daddies will be over so I can post it on a Sunday and I'll be already into this next series coming up. So um, the next series coming up to replace this one um, is going to be starting next week. Uh, it is going to be, I've got a community post out on YouTube, but it's going to be a death parade. <laughs> I've been wanting to watch death parade since death note and I'm finally getting around to it. And, um, having seen the first episode, um, there's some ties to Bungo Street Dogs in terms of, of tone and feel. So especially this season. So it'll be a, I feel like it's a worthy successor to this series. It feels like a worthy successor indeed. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Um, I'm excited to see what's going to happen, y'all. I hope y'all are too. So, we'll see, right? We shall see. So, in any case, <laughs> um, I'm curious to know your thoughts down below. Please, no manga spoilers. Um, don't tell me what's been left out. I'm going to get to it. Don't worry. Um, but in a couple weeks, we'll have the manga reaction for that. All right? So, also, just to answer your questions, I am not watching the preview for season five. It's going to be in like 12 weeks. It's going to be like here before we know it. I don't really usually like watching previews for anime anyway, unless I just really have a hankering for it. So I'm not going to watch the preview because I've heard it's full of spoilers. So I'm not going to do it. We'll have just a few short months and then we'll be back for season five. And if the animation quality and everything is like it was for this first part, it's going to be pretty damn good because I'll be honest, this has been maybe my favorite season of Bungo Stray Dogs. Dark Era is still my favorite arc, but overall, I think this is my favorite season. And we're just getting started. So, in any case, I hope you enjoyed this reaction discussion. I am curious to know your thoughts down below. But in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and yes, I'll be back this summer, y'all, with season five of Bungo Stray Dogs. Bye.